Hello and welcome back to this third lecture on chemical process design. This second part of lecture three will examine mass transfer estimation in solid liquid reactions. We'll see that the procedure is very similar to that for gas liquid reactions, except that the mass transfer correlations are of course different and depend on particle settling velocity. Particle settling is an interesting phenomenon and is very closely related to bubbles rising. We'll see that single particles settle quicker than whole swarms of particles, much in the way that single bubbles rise quicker than swarms of bubbles. We'll look at ways in which both settling velocities, hindered and unhindered, can be estimated. The fact that particles settle out at all has major practical implications for how solid liquid systems are designed. We need to ensure that the particle suspension is agitated enough to remain just suspended and we'll introduce a correlation called the Sphetering correlation that allows us to estimate impeller geometry, impeller position and impeller rotational speed in order to do this. We'll start though by seeing what can happen if particles come out of suspension. So on the whiteboard I've put two photographs for you. These photographs are of an effluent processing tank. The effluent concerned has particles suspended in it, or at least should have particles suspended in it. If you look at the left hand photograph, near the rim of the tank, if you look down a little bit you'll see there's a damp mark. That damp mark is the usual liquid level in this tank. So in operation your liquid would be very close to the lip of the tank and you'd see nothing but liquid. To all intents and purposes it looks fine. As soon as you drain the liquid away however, which was being done here for maintenance, you'll see that in fact we have a major problem. Not far below our normal liquid level, there is a massive amount of solids. Solid material that has dropped out of suspension and just accumulated over time. This solid material takes up roughly 80 to 90% of the tank volume. And this is a huge design flaw, because the operations that this tank was meant to do just simply can't happen. The reasons this happened were because that the design of the tank involved liquid jets at the base of the tank to keep some liquid swirl and it was assumed that that liquid swirl would be enough to keep the solids suspended. That initially was fine until one of the liquid jets blocked up with solids. That meant that the swirl velocities became lower, which meant that the particles dropped out of suspension quicker, which blocked up the other nozzles, which ensured that there was no swirl at all, that all the solids dropped out of suspension and you ended up in effect with a beach inside your tank. So the way in which you solve this isn't pretty. Um, you've got a couple of options. Either you get somebody into that tank with appropriate safety gear on. Remember that these solid areas have a consistency a little bit like quicksand. So you've got harnesses on, the poor person who's got to go in there and a means of getting them out quickly. And you send them in with a shovel. Would you want to do that? If you don't want to do that, don't make somebody else do that. So design the thing properly in the first place. The other way you can deal with this problem is to get a backhoe loader in and start digging the tank out. And that was tried, but unfortunately somebody nearly put the backhoe through the side of the tank, which nearly wrote the tank off. So key point here, learn from other people's mistakes. If you're dealing with suspensions of solids, do not allow your solids to settle out. And if you're dealing with suspensions of solids, ensure you've designed into your system plenty of means of deblocking it. Design in wash points. Design in easy access points. Design in bypasses if needs be to bypass pieces of equipment that are blocked such that you can keep your process going. So let's think now about solid liquid reactors. If we think about the aim of these reactors, it's going to be very, very similar to that for liquid gas reactors. What we want to do is ensure high rates of mass transfer. So we can operate on the mass transfer coefficient, the concentration gradient, or the surface area of interphase interface. And so one of the things we want to do is to promote a high surface area of solids within our liquid. So very, very fine solids kept in suspension, not as a layer. So that takes us to the second point. We want to prevent solids from settling out, both to allow lots of interface to exist, and also such that we don't end up with a piece of completely blocked process equipment. If we think about the applications of solid liquid reactors, we'll see that they're widespread. Typical systems include those where a solid is the reactant, you might be dissolving something, you might be neutralizing something, or where the solid is a heterogeneous catalyst in suspension. 
and again we want to make sure there's plenty of access to that catalyst by the liquid phase reacting species. As before the trade-off that we're playing is how is the reaction limited? Is it mass transfer limitation? Is it kinetic limitation? Or even in a batch system or maybe a long pipe reactor is it a combination of both limitations? Are we initially mass transfer limited and then kinetically limited? So we'll keep in mind at all times not only how the reactions might be limited but also how we keep the solid suspended. We want to keep our surface area and we want to get rid of any chance of blockage. So let's think about mass transfer estimation first. Here on the whiteboard I've put what looks like quite a familiar picture compared to last lecture except we now have a solid particle rather than a gas bubble and a very similar equation for the rate of interphase mass transfer. We've got our total amount of mass transferred in moles per cubic meter per second, that being equal to a mass transfer coefficient KSL meters per second, our total volumetric particle area, remember this is meters squared per meter cubed, and also our concentration driving force. So let's have a look at a small cartoon of how that concentration driving force is established. Again, we're assuming we've got sort of a stagnant film surrounding our solid, and we've got a concentration of material at that solid interface, a concentration of material in the bulk liquid, and the concentration that gradient that exists is the gradient between those two values. Now, we're going to assume that we know that concentration gradient. We can work it out in a very similar way as to how we worked out things for our gas liquid systems in the last lecture. We're also going to assume that we know our volumetric surface area. If we know the number of particles that we've got and a measure of particle diameter, we can estimate what that parameter is. So let's think about our mass transfer coefficient, KSL. Again, go to the literature and look. With minimal looking, you'll come across something called the Froessling correlation. The Froessling correlation is very useful. It applies to particles with settling velocities greater than 5 millimetres per second, and it's a Sherwood number correlation. So our Sherwood number here is written in terms of our particle Reynolds number and our Schmidt number. And our particle Reynolds number is important because, remember, our particle Reynolds number depends on the particle diameter and the particle's terminal velocity. So we need to know Vt here in order to work out our particle Reynolds number, in order to work out our Sherwood number, in order to work out KSL. And I've written the form of that equation explicitly in terms of KSL for you. If you've got very, very fine particulates that settle very, 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 very slowly, then you'll need a different correlation to the Froessling correlation. And here on the board I've put a correlation for particles that indeed settle very, very slowly. And we'll see that it's got an extra non-dimensional term in it, d over t. That's because some correlations assume that you have agitation happening and are only valid under those circumstances. d and t in this particular example are the diameters of the impeller and the diameter of the tank. If we look at the other terms in these correlations, we'll find that we've got the usual sort of liquid physical property terms. We've got viscosities and densities present, but we've also got our diffusion coefficient of species in the liquid phase. So remembering back to last lecture, we need to have some idea of what that diffusion coefficient is, and again, go into the literature and have a look. Now, what we need to think about next is how we settle, how we estimate particle settling velocity. We've seen that the particle Reynolds number, which is important for our mass transfer, is written in terms of settling velocity. Now, if our particles all settle out, this is a bad thing. We've already stated that a number of times. Not only do we lose volumetric surface area, but we block our equipment up. So we need to estimate our settling velocity and make sure that our particles remain suspended. So whatever extra agitation we put in, has to be greater than that settling velocity. If we compare how particles settle to how bubbles rise, we'll see something very, very similar. If we think back to a single bubble rising in an infinite liquid, we found through the Wallace correlation that we can estimate that rise velocity. We then, for the bubble system, estimated the rise velocity of a swarm of bubbles by taking that single bubble rise velocity and using it in the Richardson and Zaki correlation, which allowed us to calculate the rise velocity of a bubble swarm. We're going to see something very, very similar here. So first of all, our single 
particle settling velocity in an infinite liquid can be written as shown on the board. It's effectively a force balance between buoyancy forces and gravity forces. There is written in this, however, a drag coefficient. Now, here's how where we have to be careful. Our drag coefficients, CD, are written in terms of a particle Reynolds number, which, of course, is written in terms of my particle terminal velocity, Vt. So the equation that I've written on the board here is actually implicit. So be careful when you solve this. Be careful also which CD version you use. You may find that you are assuming a CD that's inherently laminar, for example, 24 over particle Reynolds number, only to find out that when you solved the equation for VT, actually your particle Reynolds number is different. And it might be in that slightly transitional regime, 18.5 over Reynolds to 0.6, where you need to be a little more careful how you solve. So, first and foremost, be careful how you solve this equation. And remember, this is for a single spherical particle in an infinite fluid. However, this is the first step in a two-step workflow, because the next thing we're going to do, much in the same way as we did with Richard and Zaki, is to estimate the terminal velocity of the particle swarm based on the terminal velocity of a single particle. And so this correlation here for hindered settling does exactly that. We've got our particle volume fraction as one of the parameters we need, along with the terminal velocity of a single particle. That power n there depends on the particle Reynolds number, which of course also depends on the terminal velocity of a single particle. So be careful how you evaluate these terms. So hindered settling and swarms of bubble rising have a very similar set of physics underpinning it. If you think about how a bubble rises through a fluid from the standpoint of the fluid, you'll get a velocity field in that fluid caused by the bubble moving through it, much as you will by a particle settling through it. If you've got more than one bubble or more than one particle, especially in close proximity, then you're going to get velocity field overlap in the liquid phase, which slows the whole thing down. And so many bubbles rising has a direct analogy to many particles settling. Let's think now about keeping particles in suspension. We don't want a beach in our tank. That's bad. And so what I'd like to do is introduce to you three suspension criteria that you'll commonly find used. The first that I've put on the board here is called partial suspension. Here is where you have a layer of solids at the base of your tank and some particles in suspension. This typically is something that you don't want to do. It's only useful if the solids are very, very highly soluble. And so what we need is a different suspension criterion where you have what is termed just suspension. All your particles are now in suspension. There's no solid layer on the base of the tank, but the concentration of particles varies in different spatial positions in your tank, but they're all suspended. So this picture here that I've labelled B, this just suspended criteria, is, if you like, usually the minimum suspension criteria that is designed into most systems. Moreover, there are correlations that allow you to estimate when you've achieved this minimum suspension criteria. If we put more energy into the system by maybe changing our agitator design and increasing the torque on it or just turning it faster, then we may be able to achieve uniform suspension. And it does exactly what it says on the tin. This is where you have a uniform concentration of particles spatially all throughout your system. And this can be useful if you've got, say, heterogeneous catalysis or maybe a crystallization process. Let's think now how we estimate this just suspended criterion. And we've got a correlation called a Sveterin correlation that allows us to do that. Here on the whiteboard, I have put the Sveterin correlation. It's reliable between 2 volume percent and 15 volume percent of solids and allows you to estimate the just suspended criteria for a given stirrer geometry. Let's look at this in some detail. NJS here is your stirrer speed required for just suspension. And notice this is in revolutions per second. If we look at the right hand side, we've got physical property groupings. You've got mu L over rho L, you've got G delta rho over rho L. You've got information pertaining to your particle. You've got your particle diameter, dp. You've got big D, which is your impeller diameter. X here is your mass ratio of solids to liquids multiplied by 100. 
And S is a special constant called a sphetering constant. And that constant depends on the size of your impeller, the size of your tank, and the position of your impeller in your tank. I want to look at the tables of data that are often used to give values of S because they sometimes need a little bit of interpretation. In your notes, I've put a far greater range of data. It's impractical to show that on a screen and doesn't actually illustrate what I want to illustrate to you now, which is how to interpret these data. So at first sight, these may seem a little baffling. 45 degree, PBT, T over 3.3, D over 2.1, C equals 2.4, S equals 4.5. What on earth does that mean? Let's take it apart piece by piece. Let's look at that second set of data that is 45 degree PBT. A PBT is a pitched blade turbine. So these three letter acronyms that follow the blade angle refers to what kind of impeller design you're dealing with. And PBT, our pitch blade turbine, is a very common one to use. And we can see in this table now we've got a pitch blade turbine with blades angled at 30 degrees to the horizontal and 45 degrees to the horizontal. OK, so let's look at T over 3.3. Well, T is our tank diameter. T over 3.3 is our impeller diameter. So it's 3.3 times smaller than our tank. D over 2.5 is our impeller diameter D divided by 2.5, and that gives you your blade width. So T over 3.3, T is tank diameter, T over 3.3 gives you your impeller diameter, D. Then D over 2.5 gives you your blade width. OK, so that's what those next two things in that table refer to. Then you've got two rows. C equals T over 4, C equals T over 8. Now C is the clearance between the base of the impeller and the base of the tank. So in effect, if you imagine that impeller rotating, it's going to be pushing liquid down into the tank, and then the liquid will rise up the walls, and so you get this sort of circulating flow field. So C over 2.4 is where you have 2.4, C over, C equals T over 4, sorry, is where you've got a quarter of the tank diameter in terms of clearance underneath your impeller. And then that will give you a sweetening constant S of 4.5. So let's recap a few key points. Mass transfer limitations for solid liquid systems follow similarly conceptually routes to that for gas liquid systems, but with different correlations that give you a mass transfer coefficient KSL. We have an added complication in liquid solid systems, which is particle settling. Don't forget that single particles can sediment faster than particle swarms, and that correlations are available to calculate both the settling velocity of a single particle and of a particle swarm. Point three is really, really important. Always ensure that your agitation system is fit for purpose. If it's not, it's going to block. So make sure you're not heading into blockage straight away. Also, if you're designing systems that are going to be handling solids in suspension, design in plenty of washing points and plenty of points to allow access to unblock things. One way to prevent blockage at the design stage is to ensure that you meet or exceed your just suspended criterion and we can use the sphetering correlation to get a first estimate of what impeller geometry, impeller speed with relation to our tank geometry is required to keep just suspension.